So you want to get rich. Have you ever heard the saying, the more you learn, the more you earn? And I absolutely agree with this saying. In the past few years, I've read hundreds of books. This has been a very big contributing factor to get me to the point where I am in life today. In this video, I'm going to review my top five books that have helped me to become a millionaire at the age of 28. These books are mainly about the topic of how to manage your money. That's a topic that you should have learned at school, but which you didn't. And that's why if you want to get rich, it is your own responsibility to educate yourself. So let's get started with these five books. Book number one is The Richest Man in Babylon, written by George S. Glasson. So this book is an absolute classic when it comes to the topic of personal finances. And I want to share two really powerful lessons out of this book. The first lesson that is discussed here in The Richest Man in Babylon is that you should always aim to pay yourself first. See what most people do when they receive their salary. First, they pay their rent, then they buy some food, they pay for some drinks, they buy some new clothes, and then whatever is left, maybe they will save it or maybe they will invest some of that. But actually, what this book is saying that is whenever you are spending all that money, it goes towards other people. So in fact, you are working hard for money in order to make other people rich. Instead, you should work to make yourself rich. This book says that the first thing you should do whenever you receive your paycheck is to take a portion of that money, put it in your savings account, and ideally invest some of that money so that it can make more money for you in the future. And that's why you should always strive to pay yourself first. We are not here in this life to make other people rich. I mean, that's not my goal and probably it's not your goal either. Then the second lesson that I want to share about this book, treat your money as if it is your children. What most people do when they receive their paycheck is they spend it and that's equivalent to cannibalizing your children. What you should be doing instead is you should give some love to your children. You should create an environment in which they can multiply. In other words, you should learn how to put your money to work because your kids can get children and those children can get more children. And that is what we refer to as the compound effect. That means that your money can grow exponentially over time if you keep reinvesting and not cannibalizing your kids, your money. And that's how people are able to grow a small fortune into a relatively big fortune by just being patient and sticking to their investment game plan over the long term. So those are two powerful lessons from the richest man in Babylon and I highly recommend you to read this book. The second book I want to discuss in this video is Rich Dad Poor Dad. I read Rich Dad Poor Dad six years ago and it completely changed my life. Nowadays, this book is my absolute Bible. Whenever someone joins my team, they first need to read this book. They don't even need to read this book. They need to study this book because I quiz them on the knowledge inside of this book. Also, many of my mentees, whenever they, they join the program, it is a mandatory reading for them to read this book. So why am I so excited about this book? Why is it my Bible? Why do I place such high value on this book? Well, in this book, Rich That Poor That, Robert Kiyosaki, the author, explains in very simple terms so that everyone can literally understand it. He explains how you can become financially free. And the key to becoming financially free is to invest your money into assets. Assets are things that can increase in value over time or that can pay you an income, a cash flow. What most people do is they do the opposite. They spend their money on liabilities. Liabilities are things that only take money out of your pocket. When you spend your money on liabilities, you will never get that money back. So what are examples of liabilities? Liabilities are, for example, designer clothes, car, expensive dinners so that's what the poor and the middle class spend their money on so what do the rich to become rich they spend their money on assets what are assets assets are for example stocks crypto real estate watches things that can increase in value over time if you want to become rich according to Robert Kiyosaki 
then you should invest your money into assets. When I read this book, I critically looked how I was spending my money, how I was managing my money. And indeed, I was spending most of my money on liabilities. So over the course of the past few years, I shifted my money management towards investing my money more into assets. I now have a multi-million dollar real estate portfolio in the Netherlands, in Dubai, in Bali. I own stocks, I own crypto, I own real estate. And I even came to the point where at the age of 28, my investment portfolio is able to completely pay for my lifestyle. I know that whenever I close my laptop, I don't have to worry about money because money still comes in through my investment portfolio. And that is really the power of following the principles in this book, Rich That Poor That. The third book that I want to discuss here in this video is called, I Will Teach You How To Be Rich by Ramit Sethi. So again, uh, this is another really powerful book and I wanna share two important lessons from this book. Ramit Sethi explains that a rich life or the definition of a rich life is different for different people. For one person being rich can be being able to spend their money on luxury and comfort. For example, flying business class, sleeping in five-star hotels. Some people can truly become really happy by spending their money on that. For other people, a rich life might mean something completely different. For example, one of my top values in life is adventure or self-development. In the past few years, I've spent over $150,000 on self-development because for me, it's, it's important to continuously grow and develop myself. And when I explain that to another person that I've invested this large sum into my own knowledge, they might call me crazy. But for me, it's an absolute no-brainer. I wouldn't think about it once or twice. I would just invest that money because I know that it will bring me a very high ROI and I know that it will give me a lot of satisfaction in the learning process. Whereas spending my money on a first class ticket doesn't give me personally that much satisfaction. Ramit Sethi also explains, once you understand how a rich life is defined for you, what truly makes you happy, then you should unapologetically spend your money on the things that make you happy and you should cut down on the things that don't really contribute much to your happiness. For example, if you do not care much about luxury or comfort and all of your friends are flying first class or business class, do you need to do what they're doing or can you just accept the fact that that is what makes them happy? Some other things might make you happier. For example, climbing the Mount Everest or going on a helicopter flight, making amazing adventures and memories with your loved ones or spending quality time with your loved ones or giving gifts to the people around you. There's many different ways that you can express your rich life and figuring out what are your happiness triggers can help you to create the true rich life that you actually desire. The second thing that I want to explain or share from this book is that you should set up your automated uh, money management system. This is almost like the first principle that we discussed from the book, The Richest Man in Babylon, only Ramit Sethi goes a little bit deeper. He says that whenever your money hits your account, you should have a game plan for that money. How are you going to allocate your money over different buckets over your savings, over your spending, so your spending account, over your investing account, and even within your investing account, in what different investments are you going to allocate it proportionally? Ramit Sethi emphasizes that investing should be something simple, mechanical, and even boring. Simple and boring over time wins from shiny objects, betting on the latest altcoin or the latest small cap stock. And this is based on data, based on science, based on observing what successful people are doing to build their wealth. And oftentimes slow and steady wins the race. Also what I see happening is that whenever the market is pumping, people become really excited to invest their money in the markets. But instead, that is not the best time to be investing your money in the markets. You should be investing your money in the markets, ideally when there's a bloodbath, when everything is down, when it's a red day, but that's generally not when people are investing because they become emotional. So when the markets go up, they become excited. When the markets go down, they become depressed and scared and fearful. So if you have an automated money management system, so you receive your paycheck and you have a predefined allocation of how you're going to spend that money and distribute it over different buckets, then it takes the emotion out of the equation. As an investor, your own emotions 
are your biggest enemy. So by making your automated money management system, you can take your emotions out of the equation. The fourth book that I want to share with you guys is The Intelligent Investor by Benjamin Graham. A book which Warren Buffett, Warren Buffett, if you don't know him, he's the goat of investing, the greatest of all times. He has generated over $100 billion in wealth with investing. And he calls this book one of the greatest books about investing. If someone like that endorses this book, then it must be a good book. So that's one of the reasons why I decided to read The Intelligent Investor. Again, two things that I want to uh, discuss here from this book. In The Intelligent Investor, Benjamin Graham explains how the markets work. So you've got two different things. You've got the market price and you've got the value. Uh, the market price and the market value are not always the same thing, but most people that are uneducated about investing think they are the same thing. For example, Tesla stock might be at $200 uh, dollars per unit, but its actual value might be $140 per unit. So meaning that it's overvalued. Most people assume that the market is rational. What does it mean? That everyone in the market has the same amount of information, that everyone makes a well-informed decision and judgment about the price of the market. But in reality, the markets are not always rational. The markets are emotional. So whenever there's something on the news or whenever there's something happening in the economy, people might become overly optimistic, overly pessimistic, which causes a description discrepancy between the value and the price of a certain asset or yeah, investment. And Benjamin Graham really goes into detail about these two concepts, value and price, and how to spot these discrepancies. Also, he explains, as an investor, you should always think about managing your risks. One interesting example is of course the portfolio of Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett, one of the best investors in the world. If you look at the companies that he is investing in, in general, they're very boring, stable, predictable companies. For example, Coca-Cola, very boring company. Geico, insurance company, not very sexy, very boring, very stable, very predictable. Um, and Benjamin Graham is saying that you can better bet on slow, stable and predictable compared to shiny object, sexy, the newest, the greatest. To give you one example, a few years ago, one of my investing mentors asked me, Mitchell, would you invest in Tesla or would you invest in Coca-Cola? And I told him, man, I'm gonna go for Tesla because that's new, that's sexy, that, that's innovative, it can change the world. He said, you have a little bit more to learn about investing. He basically laughed at me. He said, give it some time, think about your answer for a little bit, maybe read some books and in a few years, we're going to have this conversation again. And now I understand why. It is not always the best thing to focus on a new innovative company. Why? Because oftentimes the pioneers, they need to spend a lot of time, energy, resources on creating new technologies, on creating market demand, on educating the market. Whereas second or third generation of companies within, for example, the electric vehicle space can just look at what the pioneering company is doing. They can copy what has worked well for them. They can avoid what their biggest pitfalls were and they can fast track a development. And oftentimes, in the majority of the times, the pioneering companies are not the ones that are actually being super successful over the long term. Oftentimes it's the second or even third generation of companies within that technological field. So will Tesla exist in 100 years from now? We don't know. But will Coca-Cola exist in 100 years from now? Yeah, there's a high likelihood that Coca-Cola will exist in 100 years from now. And that's why Benjamin Graham says that over the long term, it's better and safer and you'll probably get better returns by betting on slow and stable, predictable companies. Last but not least, Principles by Ray Dalio. If you don't know who Ray Dalio is, I highly recommend you to uh, read up on him. He's a very inspiring person. Uh, Ray Dalio is a multi-billionaire. He's in the Forbes list and he has generated his wealth by running one of the most successful hedge funds in financial history. In this book, Ray Dalio explains his principles for life and business. What do we mean with principles? Basically with principles, we mean standardized decision making. During a day, we are faced with many different critical decisions. I believe 
that during a day and many high performers follow the same philosophy that during a day we can make only a limited amount of great decisions. You want to standardize your decision making as much as possible so that you leave these eight important decisions for things that truly move the needle forward. So one example that I can give to you is uh, Steve Jobs. So whenever I found Steve Jobs videos on the internet a few years ago, I was always shocked by the fact that he was wearing the same turtleneck and the same pair of jeans every single day. I thought, how can someone as rich as Steve Jobs wear the same clothes every single day? Well, it all makes sense right now. Steve Jobs doesn't want to waste his important decision making, his important decisions, what clothes he's going to wear or what breakfast he's going to eat. So he just standardized those things so that he could leave his decision making power to make other more important decisions throughout the day. Another example that I can give to you is why does a chef in the kitchen always teach his recipes or always make use of a recipe. Why? Because these recipes are formulas create really great tasty food consistently and predictably. The whole point of this book of, of Ray Dalio is that you should make more systems in your life. You should have better decision making principles so that you can focus on things that actually move the needle forward. So if I think about this in terms of my investing decisions, I have personally created my investing game plan. So I know that whenever I receive my paycheck at the end of the month, I already have a system in place how I'm going to invest that money. I don't need to think about it once or twice because it's already mapped out. There's already percentages, there's already allocations and it becomes almost effortless. I see this as almost going to the gym. It becomes a habit. Every single month, it's a habit to invest my money. And I think if one of the most successful investors in the world is thinking about investing in life in this way, then I think it might be interesting for you to copy that same mentality. I want to leave you with one final quote from Tony Robbins, one of the biggest success coaches that we have right now. He says, if you want to achieve great results, you should find someone that has achieved the results that you want to achieve and copy what they have done. And that's why I've put a lot of time and energy into studying people like Ray Dalio and studying people like Warren Buffett because they are actually some of the most successful people in the investing space. And I believe success leaves clues. That's why I wanted to include this video too. So this brings us to the end of this video. I hope that you found it super valuable to learn more about these books. I highly recommend you to buy these books. I think all together you can buy them for 100 bucks, 120 bucks, all of these five books. Read them, study them, don't go into full information consumption mode, but please understand that you won't get any results without implementation. So results equals information plus implementation. That being said, thank you so much for watching this video. If you like this video, make sure to hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, and then you'll be notified whenever I drop more videos like this. Thank you so much. I'll see you in the next one.